if there were no eyes and no brain, which indeed was true for most of the history of the universe, then there's no colour. No colour. I think colour is a fiction because it's created by the brain. Like a novelist creates a story, so the brain creates colour. But how do you know that you're not dreaming? How do we know when it's ever right? How do we know that perception is different from a dream? The more science probes the mystery of sight, the more magical it seems to grow. Indeed, what would our world be without its endless gifts? Without that international language of the soul, spoken only by the eyes. For one woman who delighted in color, seeing became an impossible dream until her brain, in partnership with technology, presented her with seeing ears. And what if you're sighted, but your friends look like strangers, and you can't read their faces, and can't speak the language of emotions, that language communicated by the eyes? It measures a mere 25 millimeters in diameter, yet can move in one blink from the Earth to the faraway stars. This tiny organ, capable of encompassing creation, is so complex and powerful, it's been used as an argument against evolutionary theory. For how could such an astounding instrument be anything other than heaven sent? Today, science is unmasking the awesome abilities of the true ruler behind the throne of the eye. And what we're learning about the brain is inspiring excitement and hope around the world. Of all our senses, sight is central to our growth as intelligent beings, our most important tool in understanding science, the world, and each other. It lies at the heart of human imagination and creativity. That's one small step for man, one and connects us to the global community through shared imagery. What we see can sway nations to hatred, inspire empathy and compassion, topple governments, unite us in laughter, pleasure, and sorrow. What we see feeds our emotional life, becomes caught in the amber of memory, and can return, even in dreams, to haunt or comfort us. We used to say, a photo never lies. We thought the same of sight. Our eyes, we thought, worked like a camera. But we're starting to sense there's more going on than meets the eye. Since he was a child, Richard Gregory, former professor of neuropsychology at Bristol University, 
and inventor of optical instruments, has been fascinated by how we see. Well, people often say that the eye is like a camera, and this is kind of true, but it's not anything like the whole truth. Here's a camera, and it has a lens on the front here, of course, and we have a lens in the eye, and it has a screen on the back which has a picture. The same is true of the eye. Now, I look at the picture here, and then my brain interprets that, and I have a mental image or picture, which is completely different from the optical. And this is where things get tricky, difficult, and exciting and interesting. It's the difference from the camera that matters. Although the eyeball itself is a camera, it's the brain is responsible for seeing. It's all there for the trained eye to read, Watson. But look here, why couldn't he have been attacked on his way to the woman's apartment? And what our brain does is use individual experience to interpret what the eye sees. That was a guess. I never guess, Watson. You get the idea in the end that vision works not by directly representing the world, but by cooking up a story of what might be out there on the basis of bits and pieces of information we call clues. And I think Sherlock Holmes is the model here, that he guessed what was going on from little tiny clues. Mr. Holmes, how did you know about this? The other only heard 15 minutes ago. Depending on his individual experience... Too late, Watson. Now this time, Farrell and Kerner did too. What? Did Dr. Watson's interpretation of visual clues may differ greatly from the deductions of his hero. But how do you know about them? Elementary, my dear Watson. This man has been dead for at least two hours. And Moriarty isn't wasting any time. Hello? And that's all the eye can really provide. It doesn't provide a window to reality in any meaningful sense. It provides snippets of information from which the brain creates both conceptual notions of reality that you can describe in language and also the experience of what appears to be real through the eyes and the other senses. The working methods of the eye are as intriguing as those of any private eye. When we look at something, Light waves from that object pass through the cornea at the front of the eyeball. Through the curved lens, which turns the image on its head, to the rods and cones, light-sensitive receptors in the back room of the retina, which convert it into electrical impulses. This coded neural message is delivered by the optic nerve to that master detective, the brain, which interprets it and sets it back on its feet. Making sense of visual messages demands so much brain power that a huge amount of the brain's neural real estate is assigned to sight. Half our brain is devoted to vision, the human brain, it's quite extraordinary. If you take a dog, I mean half its brain is connected with smell, you know, but we are visual animals. And as such, we glory in color, color we drink in through our eyes, with an eagerness suggesting emotional and spiritual thirst. As Isaac Newton's apple was to gravity, so bubbles shed light on the question of color, a question which tantalized thinkers since ancient times. They're magical because color comes from nowhere. I mean, the water's not colored. Where does the color come from? And in fact, that intrigued Sir Isaac Newton in the 17th century and John Locke, the philosopher, who was a friend of his. And they asked, where does the color come from? The bubble's color, they suggested, came from the nature of light, which is interfered with by the thickness or thinness of the film of water. Then they realized that the color's not actually in the film at all, in the water, in the bubble, it's in the brain, and it's created by the brain, and all the light gives is stimulation to the eye. The brain then interprets those signals as color, as shapes, as objects. 
By the end of the 17th century, with interest in experimental science on the rise, Locke became convinced that knowledge is derived through the senses. Objects, he believed, possess secondary qualities which stimulate ideas in us, and primary qualities which are independent of us. Like the wetness of the bubble, the fact that if you prick it, it breaks, these are physics. And John Locke called these primary characteristics. But then when you look at the color, that would not exist if there were no eyes and brains in the universe. So that the bubble would exist as an object, but not as a colored thing. So that colors were secondary, dependent on eyes and brains. And it's still pretty mysterious what exactly is objective primary in the universe, what is secondary subjective created by the brain. And we're still quite unsure sometimes whether a thing is really out there or whether it's only in your head. But such questions might never enter our head if we couldn't see, because our eyes helped our brains to develop. The eye was the greatest invention ever, because by probing into the distance, seeing not immediately but far away, animals could get early warning of what was going to happen by sight, telling them about things in the distance. And that meant intelligence could develop, because instead of having to respond immediately, like when something was eating you, attacking you, you had time to think out the strategy. So it enabled the brain to develop strategies to plan into the future, to decide what the owner of the eye wanted or was afraid of. It really freed the brain to be intelligent. Although our most important sense, sight, is the last to develop, and its growth is contingent on gaining experience. Vision is different from the other senses in that it does not get stimulated in utero. Experience actually starts after the baby is born. Not so long ago, people thought babies were born blind. Now we know newborns can see, although not very well. They favor large, high contrast patterns. To measure visual acuity, or the finest detail a baby can see, scientists use an eye chart for newborns, taking advantage of their preference for patterns. Quentin, there we go, that's a good look, bud. We show them stripes, great big fat stripes, and we make the stripes skinnier and skinnier to find out the smallest stripes the baby can resolve. So their visual acuity is 30 to 40 times worse than that of an adult. Visual acuity improves really rapidly during the first four months postnatally, so that a four-month-old can see five times better than a newborn. By six, a child's visual acuity is as good as an adult's. Here we go. Madeline, hi, beautiful. Certain other aspects of seeing, for example, the ability to discriminate between faces won't be entirely adult-like until sometime between 14 and 16. You ready? That's a really good look. How about this But from their first hour of life, babies respond with interest to face-like patterns. Beautiful. Hello. Now, the baby then learns very, very quickly. Within two or three months, it has an amazing amount of knowledge of the world around it. And that knowledge is partly inherited and mostly gained through experience. I think you can only see when you've had some experience, initially genetically inherited experience, very, very soon your own individual experience, and it's handling objects. It enables you to be able to see objects and what they're really like. You can see that it's hard or it's soft or it's wet if it's water. And these properties you learn by association from handling objects. There's no question about it. This is the basis of seeing.
I think if you couldn't touch things, and above all, if you couldn't move, if you couldn't interact with things, <clears throat> you'd be blind. There's an innateness going on here. We don't only have knowledge from our own experience, but we inherit it. How does a baby know, or a child know, that a smile means pleasure? Yeah. The facial expressions are inherited from millions of years back, and so the baby has innate expressions representing uh, happiness or fear, and Darwin, of course, had a theory about that originally. The facial expressions were functional, and your mouth kind of droops originally to get rid of sort of sour things. Yeah. And it now means you're a sour puss. You know, when you've got that sort of expression, mm. it becomes symbolic. And so the idea is that all these things were originally functional and they become symbolic, representing to yourself or to somebody else rather than being immediately functional. But what happens if you can't recognize faces at all, let alone read them? It's hard to do research on people who are dead, but my great-great-great-grandfather, there was one old family tale that uh, he always talked about his wife's hair. He was obsessed with her hair. Hair may be crucial if you've trouble with faces, a problem which can be inherited. Another of Bill Sozier's relatives got shot by the cops because he couldn't tell who they were. My uh, great-grandfather had an incident, actually, where he was killed, where he didn't recognize people, and there were police officers, and that caused him some problems. Yeah, he, he got killed. There's major problems. <laughs> For much of his life, Bill felt like an outcast on the social scene, always on the outside, looking in. I guess I've always been sort of a loner, not really by choice, and now I realize that the situation had to do with my difficulty in connecting with people. A lot of times I'll go to a party and if there's only three or four people I recognize, I'll just concentrate on talking to those people because it's pointless to befriend other people. You go off to the punch bowl and when you can't come back, you can't find them. For Pat Fletcher, seen in the center, the world seemed a friendlier place. At 21, she'd just graduated from college and was planning a career working with animals. I was working in an industrial plant to earn money to go to vet school. And the particular day that I came into work, they had overfilled the discharge tanks. Um, they had, we make chromate um, grenades. I went to crack open this 55-gallon barrel of caustic soda, and I thought the barrel looked a little funny, and I asked the people up front what to do about it, and they said, just use it, it'll be fine. So when I cracked it open... The explosion melted Pat's right eye, destroyed both lids, and propelled her into the world of blindness. I had to accept the emptiness of it, the grayness of it. Imagine yourself being on the road at night, a dark night, and the fog is coming in front of you, hitting your headlights. That's how my world is. It's just nothing but empty fog, voices around me. As a sighted person, I would smile because I could look up and see the red bird, see the tree. I used to love the trees, but I no longer have that ability to enjoy life, to enjoy the colors, to enjoy the movement of a bird, or to look out across a sunset. That's all lost. But Pat resolved to find that joy again. She was blind now, but determined that someday she would see. In the past decade, 
Technology has granted scientists entry into the Aladdin's cave of the brain, helping them make perhaps the most valuable neuroscientific breakthrough in centuries. This jewel of a find, which would surely have delighted Newton and Locke, offers hope for us all, but especially the injured. What they've confirmed is that the brain is capable of remolding itself, a capability called plasticity, in the same way sculpting is called a plastic art, because the material can be shaped and reshaped. Experience is the brain sculptor and shapes how we see. Even when sight disappears, the brain still has some tricks up its sleeve. But it took Pat many years of blindness before she discovered them. It was total devastation because when you wake up and you've got nothing but bandages on your eyes, you first don't really think about, this is it, I'm blind, because it's just too much of a shock to accept. I made up my mind that there was, I was either gonna go crazy, sit, sit down and whine about it, and just be a, a depressed person, uh, commit suicide, which is a very option, or get up and do something about it. I always say step forward, because there's no way back. So I learned to live life as a blind person. I went to a rehab center and uh, learned to pick up the cane and become a blind person. But in the late 80s, Pat discovered computers. Convinced technology could help, she felt her way doggedly through its complexities until she found a software program that would ultimately lighten the darkness and I installed it. And what happens is the image is brought into the program. The program then transfers that into a sound representation of that that's in the image and you listen to it and eventually the brain understands what's there. The program helps Pat's brain to substitute information from her other senses. What Pat uses is a, a method called the voice, which has a very tiny video camera in the glasses that she wears that captures the world, does a sweep of the world in front of her every second. And that image is then converted into a soundscape, a picture of sounds, using three very basic rules. Whatever appears at the top of the screen is voiced by a higher pitch than whatever's at the bottom. Whatever's on the right is heard on the right, same with the left. And whatever is bright sounds louder than whatever is dark. See all the leaves? <laughs> I bought a small webcam and I put it on a ball cap and uh, bought a notebook, a great big heavy notebook, and put the gear together as best I could, and that's when I had my first experience of seeing mobile. I uh, stepped out into my hall, not expecting anything, and looked, and there were the blinds hanging on the wall, and I stood there and cried. I just couldn't believe it. I was actually, actually seeing like a sighted person again. Not as perfect as a sighted person, but I could see it. For centuries, scientists believed the brain grew in childhood, then remained rigidly fixed till the slow decline of age.
Some still believe each of our senses is controlled from a specific hardwired location in the brain. But new evidence is telling a different story. And it's saying that when one sense fails, its area of the brain can be put to work by the remaining senses in a way that compensates for the loss. If you no longer have vision, then the question that comes up is what happens to that lots of brain? What does it do? Does it just go idle? Does it start doing other things? Can it be used to learn new things? And so we became interested in exploring what parts of their brain in people like Pat are being engaged by this tool that they use, this sensory substitution tool that takes visual information and converts it into sound. So what we're going to do is test you on identifying objects using the voice. Functional MRI studies show that visual as well as auditory parts of Pat's brain are activated when she uses the voice. What we want to know now is whether that activity... To find out how essential these visual areas are, Pasquale Leone plans to use TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, a device he helped develop, to block their activity. Okay. So, Pat, I'm going to actually list out the objects that you're going to be seeing with the voice right now, and Sarah's going to hand them out to you. So the first one is a water bottle. Okay. So I'm placing the first object in front of you. To begin, Pat familiarizes herself with a series of objects by listening to their soundscapes with the voice. The next one is a spider. It's also on a white background. Spider? Yes, it's a spider. She then successfully identifies a random selection of the same objects. There's a perfect soundscape of the saw. You can hear the sound and then you can hear the handle and the teeth. Okay, I can hear the legs in it this time. And so we are delivering pulses on the occipital pole, which is right in the back of your head. Interesting. The way we disrupt the activity is using non-invasive brain stimulation. So ways of, of inducing a, a current in the part of the brain that we are uh, targeting and applying it in such a way that it will decrease, shut down for a short period of time. But as soon as TMS is applied, her ability to identify the objects falters. Ever put aluminum on your teeth? <laughs> aluminum foil? On, on my teeth? Uh-huh. No. That's what the soundscapes sound like now. Maybe the cup? Close, it was the water bottle. Water bottle? Mm-hmm. And this object is attached to a clamp. With the visual areas of her brain deactivated, Pat's ears can no longer help her to see. Maybe the giraffe? It was the seashell. It's too blurry. The wrench, maybe? Maybe the spider? It's like everything's underwater. It's all washed out. So we've learned that not only is this visual part of the brain activated, but that it's actually needed or causally related um, to the ability to use the voice. The mind, when it's exposed to it, it wants to see. It, it wants to understand what's around it. The voice, invented by Dutchman Peter Meyer and offered free over the web, has reconnected Pat to her joy in life. Who'd ever think houseworking could be fun? <laughs> while her ability to see through her ears confirms what Pasquale Leone and others have long suspected about the adaptability of modules in the brain. Instead of thinking of the brain as a large part of it devoted to sight and a large part of it devoted to hearing and so forth, to think of the brain as organized in, in areas that do a certain computation. Now it's all dark down in here. See if it could catch the steam. 
all part of learning to see again. <laughs> the pleasures <laughs> of learning to see again. <laughs> so the idea is that the brain is really a dynamically changing um, structure, a, a, an array of connections that can be weighted up or down, can be used more or less depending on the outcome that is, that is best suited for the individual. Connections have to exist in all of us, in all sighted subjects, that can be unmasked, that can be activated. So what that means, uh, ultimately, is that the visual cortex, even though it appears to only receive visual information, in fact, it must receive other types of information, at least have the connections to receive it. Whether we use it or not is a different thing. But for someone like Bill, making the most basic human connections seemed impossible without the ability to recognize and interpret people's faces. Love, as the poet Yeats once wrote, comes in at the eye. As babies, we learn to read in the faces of those close to us crucial human emotions, and so start to understand not just ourselves, but others. Through sight, we find the thread that binds us to each other in families, friendships, communities. Yet what we see could be defined as merely basic patterns. When you look at one face and then another, they're really incredibly similar. I mean, you've all got two eyes and a nose and a mouth, and basically very, very similar. And yet we can recognize perhaps a thousand different people at first glance. It's an amazing achievement. And the idea is that this is carried out by a specialist little bit of a computer in what's called a module. And if you lose that module, or there's something wrong with it, then you can't recognize your next door neighbor, you know, and you meet them in the street. And, you pass them by, it's a real problem. It was certainly Bill's problem. His other problem? He didn't know he had a problem. All he knew was that as a young lawyer with 20-20 vision, he couldn't recognize his clients in court. The attorney didn't work out so well because I couldn't read faces of people, and being a lawyer is a big sales job, really and I couldn't sell people on anything because I just couldn't play the game. It makes me feel less connected than other people. I can be standing right next to someone I know and I don't know that I know them. As a small boy, Bill developed complex coping strategies, concentrating on genes and hairstyles to tell people apart. In his teens, he dreamed of wearing jeans himself and growing his hair and beard. But his mom insisted on crew cuts, sometimes refusing to let him eat till he'd visited the barber. He felt alienated, not just from others. You look at the face of someone to see what they're feeling, and if you have problems recognizing people and with their emotions, as some face blind people do, you just miss out on that connection. What I don't see is the meaning behind a face. I don't see the identity of the person. I don't see the emotions of the person. He also felt estranged from himself. There's a question I often get asked, do you recognize yourself in a mirror? And my answer is yes now but I didn't used to until I grew my hair out. And before I could recognize myself, somehow I didn't have a sense of self. I just couldn't separate myself from other people and at a certain subconscious level. And I was always kind of adrift. Bill left the law and moved to San Francisco, where he slowly began to figure out who he was. If I look at a face, if there's no hair or anything near the face, there's no identity there. And a long-haired man, I can often see 
their facial expressions better. I can tell if they're laughing or unhappy or whatever. It's seeing at a deeper level. It's seeing the subconscious stuff that's behind the image. He was in his early 30s when he met Larry, but it wasn't until he was 48 that Bill finally, with Larry's help, perceived his underlying problem. We were watching a movie on TV, and Bill said that he thought different characters had died several times, and he didn't realize that there were several different people in the movie where he thought they were all the same person. We got talking about how the film had a lot of close-up shots. And I said, well, I sure mix the people up when they do that. And then we analyzed it a little bit further and talked about the different shots they were taking of people. And with him working in television, he was familiar with why they did certain things. And I said, well, people like close-ups so they can see the facial expressions. Close-ups give that a lot better. At first, we said something to the effect of, well, I guess that's just one way we're different from each other. And then he said, well, most people must be like me or the show wouldn't have any ratings and it wouldn't be on the air. And at that point, we realized that I wasn't just different from him, but I was probably different from most people. Armed with his new insight, Bill set out on a quest to know more and found a community of fellow sufferers. Like Bill, some could only recognize their friends from the back. Others had trouble finding their own kids when they picked them up from daycare. Bill discovered the problem had a Greek name. He simply called it face blindness. Prosopagnosia is what scientists call it, the inability to recognize faces. Brad Duchesne specializes in this type of visual impairment. Recently, there's been a lot of work um, both on acquired prosopagnosics and developmental prosopagnosics. The, the developmental work is especially new. You know, 15 years ago, it wasn't even clear that the condition existed. Conditions like face blindness do suggest that the visual system is composed of sort of different specialized units. And we're still not sure how common it is, but it could be as much as 2% of the population has some significant trouble recognizing faces in everyday life. Uh, we've now tested several families that are, have a lot of people in them who can't recognize faces. We had one family that's got 10 members who can't recognize faces. We tested another one last Christmas where there were seven members who couldn't recognize faces. So um, it's clear that there's a genetic basis to the condition in some cases, but certainly not all. Many children in the autism spectrum have difficulty recognizing and reading faces, which may play a role in how they connect with others. Face blind, the website started by Bill has been responsible for helping countless individuals who once, like Bill, felt completely alone. Typically, he was startled when first asked to share what he'd written on the site. Some gal in Arizona said, can I have a copy of that? And I said, well, I really kind of wrote it for myself and it's kind of private and personal and I did it. And Anybody else can do it. She says, yeah, but it took you 50 years. She says, my son doesn't want to wait 50 years. Brad Duchesne had to wait until he'd grown a beard before Bill felt relaxed enough to grant him an interview. But Bill's story and website helped the young scientist expand his research into face blindness. Bill's website's been hugely important for a lot of people. They find this website and all of a sudden they say, aha, you know, this is me, they're reading all of Bill's experiences and they've had all those same experiences. And people find it really uh, quite a relief to find out that they're not the only ones who have these sorts of problems. After almost 50 years of what he once described as pure hell, the man without connections today has thousands. Thank you.
a different kind of blindness called visual form agnosia brought a young woman to Western's visual motor lab. It was the opening chapter of a startling story about the dual nature of our visual system, a discovery made by neuroscientists David Milner and Mel Goodale. The patient had suffered brain damage from carbon monoxide poisoning. She was in a coma for, uh, for at least 24 hours. But when she came out of the coma, it was clear uh, that she was blind, cortically blind, that is, she didn't see anything. But over subsequent days, her vision began to clear, and now she began to see colors and uh, visual textures. She could recognize the sweater that her husband was wearing. But what she commented on was that she couldn't recognize her husband's face. She couldn't see the form of objects. So she was, if you like, form blind. Even though she could see the material properties of objects, she could see what they were made of, that something was made of wood or wool or whatever, uh, she couldn't see its shape uh, or its form. Yet when asked to perform tasks similar to these, such as placing the card in the slot, the patient was able to do so. This disconnect between perception and action intrigued the scientists. Okay, I today we'll Further observations, backed up by brain imaging research, help prove that our brain has two completely separate visual systems. One, termed vision for perception, helps us recognize and interpret the world around us. The other, vision for action, helps us move about in that world. Of course, athletes are a wonderful example of vision for action working supremely well because they clearly can throw balls or hit balls or jump over hurdles in ways that are so beautiful and are so difficult for us to even conceive how we could do it. And yet, if we ask them to describe what visual information they were using to do this, I think they'd be at a loss for words. Less conscious, more instinctive, vision for action is the oldest part of our visual system, originating as a primordial way for simple organisms to control movement toward light. While vision for perception, a way of interpreting the external world to ourselves and others, evolved later as primates advanced in complexity and intelligence. Now, this may seem uh, kind of crazy that you could have two visual systems operating in a single brain, but in fact, that is the case. And while resting this case, why not consider a glass of beer? You recognize this as a glass of beer. And if you lean forward uh, so that it had a different projection on your retina, it would still look like a glass of beer. And if you had too many glasses of beer, and if the last thing you saw when you pitched forward uh, was a glass of beer, you'd still recognize it as such. In other words, we have object constancy. It doesn't matter what the projection is on our retina of the object, that is, it's geometrically different on every occasion. We recognize it as the same object, a glass of beer. And for this, let us thank our vision for perception. But not yet. We still have to lift that beer. And for that, we need that other shadowy, more muscular system, vision for action. What your brain has to do is to compute the real size of the glass of beer, the orientation of the handle, the distance of the handle from your hand, uh, and how you have to shape your hand in order to duck in and grab the handle successfully. So really fundamentally different uh, computations are involved. But thanks to both, that beer can finally be enjoyed. And that magical dance of eye and brain continue, where even those who haven't had a beer may often stumble on social cues. Three of hearts, your card, comes in the middle of the deck. I just snap my fingers and it comes to the top. <coughs> Too fast? That's free. <laughs> Thank you. Now watch very carefully. I'll, the handkerchief comes into my hand and um, Liam, would you please blow on it? Here and <coughs> Gustav Kuhn uses his awareness of our visual gullibility 
for his own devious ends. <laughs> I've always enjoyed watching magic as a child. When I was about 12, I sort of just started practicing magic together with a friend. Well, I've now been able to combine my two major passions in life, one of them magic and the other one psychology, in order to sort of use, use magic as a way of investigating the human visual system. So I'm going to put the eye tracker on your head. Set this like so. I'm just going to tighten it. So the blue is now locking onto anything that's black, which is your pupil. So now I'm going to show you the first magic trick. All I'd like you to do is just watch a trick and try and find out how this is done. Did you see how the light had disappeared? No. No. So one of the key aspects of magic involves preventing you from seeing certain things. Um, and this is usually achieved through the process of misdirection, so which involves misdirecting people's attention so as to prevent them from seeing important parts of the secrets. First of all, what we find is there's a very high consistency in people's eye movements, so people tend to follow the magician's gaze, and this, can, this tells us that these social cues, so where the magician is looking, is very important in terms of manipulating another person's eye movements. But what's really interesting about this is that people's detection, so whether people actually spot the dropping light or not, is not really related to where they're looking. So, most of the people who fail to spot the lighter, they're looking at the other hand. But at the same time, the people who spot the lighter, they're looking in exactly the same places. So this tells us that the reason why they didn't spot it is not necessarily because they just didn't look at it and therefore the visual system didn't receive enough of the information. In fact, we've got cases where people are looking very closely to the event, so their fixation is on the event, yet they don't see it. And the reason for this is because what's actually being manipulated or misdirected is their attention rather than just their eye movement. So these kind of tricks, they can give us sort of a good insight into the relationship between eye movement, attention and visual awareness. One clerk jumping out of the deck, the uh, six of clubs, your car. What was your card? Three hearts. Three of hearts. Would you please just blow on it? And it does, in fact, turn into <laughs> three of hearts, your card. <laughs> it's just a very good sense to study, but above all, it's our richest sense. It's got the most going on, and it's got a load of illusions when the thing produces crazy answers. And I find those very, very interesting, the phenomena of illusion departing from physics to the individual world of our experience is a magical thing, leading into art. I mean, art, of course, is handling illusion the whole time. Neurobiologist Margaret Livingston believes that artists were always a step ahead, where the secrets of sight were concerned. This is a painting by Raoul Dufy that illustrates something that artists figured out that turns out to have a deep neurobiological basis. And what they figured out is that you don't have to color inside the lines. You see this often in watercolors and pastels. This is an oil painting. It's almost a parody of the watercolor technique. The neurobiological basis is that cells that code color have big, coarse, receptive fields. They have low acuity, much lower than the cells that encode contour. So because your visual system doesn't use the color to define the borders of an object, the color can be kind of sloppy, and you just assign the color to the nearest border. And so that's what he's doing here. Of course, these artists discovered it long before us neurobiologists. But you just have contours with some soft color approximately in the same position as the contour, and your visual system just assigns that color to that object. 
Somehow, I get a feeling of new truth, new ideas through illusion. I find all that absolutely wonderful. The wonder Richard Gregory felt as a child, faced with the magic of seeing, has never left him. I just think the universe is so utterly astounding from stars downward. My father was an astronomer. Actually, I was brought up with stars. As sight binds us to each other, so it links us to the universe, to the stars from which we came. The whole of everything, really, your knowledge, your emotional life, everything is very, very much visual or triggered by vision. That's a miracle of sight, really, that once you've got the knowledge, you can read the future, you can, you can certainly predict the future, you can actually see the past, like in astronomy, and the whole world is enriched.